Part 2, Chapter 5 Marceau has refused the chaplain three times. He was moved to a new cell, one where he can see the sky, and he spends nights watching the stars. He keeps thinking about escaping the machinery of it all. He wishes he read more about it, that there was at least one instance of escape so he could have some hope, some chance of escape. But in the end, the machinery would always get you. He tries to understand it, but he can't accept the certainty. From verdict to the end, it's a straight line of things. It didn't matter what time the verdict was read or what reason or for what people. If anything, those things took away from how serious the sentence was. He remembers a story of his father, who he never met. He went one day to see an execution, but even thinking of it made him sick. When he got back, he spent half a day throwing up. Marceau realizes it's important to see those things because of how serious they are. He even promises to see every execution he can if he can get out. But the thought of being on the outside is like poison and makes him feel cold to the point where his teeth chatter. He would also spend his time changing the law in his head. The most important thing was to give a condemned man a chance. For example, making a chemical that kills 9 times out of 10. The problem with the guillotine was that it always works. Even if it doesn't work the first time, they would just do it again. This makes the prisoner want the machine to work for the first time, as if the prisoner is even hoping he gets executed. He also realizes that you don't have to climb stairs for the guillotine, that in the modern era, you just walk right up at street level and lay down. It was very simple. The two things he thinks about is the dawn and his appeal. He would try not to by listening to his heartbeat and trying to imagine the moment his heart would no longer be heard inside his head. The guards always came at dawn, so Marceau would sleep a little during the day, stay up most of the night in order to listen and wait. If they didn't get him at a certain time, he'd gain another 24 hours. He remembers Mama saying that a person can find happiness anywhere, and he found happiness in the sky shifting to a new day. All day long, he would think of his appeal. He had to first convince himself that his appeal was rejected. He would reason that life isn't worth living anyway, and that it didn't matter if you died at 30 or 70 because you're still the one dying. Everyone else just goes on living. He would sometimes jump at the thought of living another 20 years, but Marceau has to actively convince himself that, since everyone dies, it doesn't matter when. Only now, at this point in his thoughts, would he start to think about if he was pardoned. Immediately, he would feel his heart jump and his blood rush. Then he would have to calm himself down by thinking of the rejection again. At one of these moments, after he just refused a chaplain, and when he rejects his own appeal, he starts thinking about Marie. He hasn't thought of her in a while. He starts thinking about what if she found someone else, or got sick or died. It's been a while since she wrote, and since they aren't together, there's nothing really keeping her around. He wasn't interested in her dead. At that moment, the chaplain came in. At first, Marceau shudders because it's not the chaplain's usual time. The chaplain tells him not to worry and that he knows nothing about his appeal. The chaplain sits and asks Marceau to join him, which Marceau refuses. He sits there a while in silence. The chaplain asks why Marceau has refused to see him. Marceau tells him it's because he doesn't believe in God. The chaplain asks if he's sure, and if it's not just desperation talking. Marceau responds that he's not desperate, just afraid. The chaplain says that every criminal in Marceau's shoes before have turned to God, and Marceau says that that was their right. Marceau doesn't have time for it, and anyway, he doesn't need anyone's help. The chaplain gets annoyed, then calms down. Then he says how everyone dies, and that when that moment comes, how will he be able to face it? Marceau says exactly how he's facing it now. The chaplain stands up and looks at Marceau straight in the eye and says, Have you no hope at all? And do you really think that when you die, you die and nothing remains? Marceau says yes. The chaplain says he pities Marceau. Marceau starts to get annoyed. The chaplain begins asking questions but sounds genuinely upset. The chaplain says that he believes the appeal will be granted but that Marceau has to get rid of his burden of sin. Marceau says he doesn't know what a sin is. They found him guilty, so he was paying for it. The chaplain says that more can be asked of him, that he could be asked to see, in the suffering stones of his cell, he has to look for a divine face. Rousseau responds that he's been looking at these stones for months, and in the beginning he searched for a face, one as bright as a sun in the flame of desire, Marie, but nothing was there. Nothing ever came out of those sweating stones. The chaplain is sad. He asks to embrace Rousseau, and Rousseau says no. Then he asks Rousseau if he really loves Earth that much, and Rousseau doesn't answer. There's a period of silence. And right as Marceau is about to tell him to go, the chaplain turns around saying he doesn't believe him and that at one point or another, he wanted a different life. Marceau tells him that that's enough. Then the chaplain wants to talk about God again. Marceau says that he only has a little time left and he doesn't want to waste it on God. The chaplain then wants to know why Marceau doesn't call him father and instead calls him monsieur. That makes Marceau mad because he's not his father, not even on his side. The chaplain says Marceau's heart is blind and that he will pray for him. At this point, Marceau snaps. 
Marceau yells at him and grabs him by the collar, telling him not to pray for him. This chaplain was so certain of everything, but all his certainties weren't worth one hair of a woman's head. He was living like a dead man because Marceau was much sure of his life and even his death. Nothing matters. He could have lived this way or another way. It doesn't matter. Whether it was a mother's love or God, it was all the same. Everybody was privileged and everybody gets condemned. What would it matter if he were accused of murder and executed because he didn't cry at his mother's funeral? Solomon's dog was worth as much as a chaplain's wife. Celeste and Raymond were the same. Everybody could be just as guilty. Marie was kissing another Merceau. Nothing mattered. At this point, the guards pull Merceau off the chaplain. The chaplain is crying and leaves. Marceau falls asleep and wakes in the middle of the night. He can smell the country, but then hears the sirens calling for the guillotine. He thinks of Maman for the first time in a long time. He understands now why she took a fiancé so late in life. To start over at the very end. Near death, she wanted to live again. Nobody, nobody had the right to cry over her. It's as if the anger has washed him clean. Marceau feels the indifference of the world and greets it like a brother. To feel less alone, he had only to wish that there be a large crowd of spectators the day of his execution, and that they greet him with cries of hate.